All right, welcome everybody to a new episode of Genuine Rockstars. Today we are joined by Chris Unium, Junium, I should say, uh, and Aubrey Zirkel. Uh, we've got Chris coming in from the US and we've got Aubrey coming in from Spain. Thank you guys so much for joining. Yeah, we're, we're excited to be here. Thanks for having us. It's really fun. Um, could you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Okay. Um, so I'm an associate professor of earth sciences at Syracuse University in Syracuse, New York, which is right in the middle of New York State. Um, I am a stable isotope and organic geochemist. And, um, you know, I up apply uh, these tools to mostly paleo environmental type of questions, um, you know, redox and paleoecology and, 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 you know, big events through Earth history. So obviously the KPG is something that I've been interested in lately. So. And I'm Aubrey Zirkel. I'm a reader in the School of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. So unfortunately, I don't always reside in Spain. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that later. But um, it's been nice. That's why I'm sunburned uh, at the moment. This is a very unusual uh, climate for Scotland. Uh, I am also, I'm a geobiologist and a stable isotope geochemist, and um, I am also really interested in major transitions in Earth history and in applying these tools to, to sort of seeing how Earth and life have evolved over Earth history. I generally uh, focus on the Precambrian uh, and the Archean in particular, and so uh, with this collaboration with Chris, he's really sort of pulled me forward in time. Um, and, and actually, my very, very first research project when I was an undergraduate student was looking at K KPG Impact Breccia. So I feel like I've come full circle now. So, but how did you guys be decide to become a geobiologist or geochemists? W what aspects of geochemistry do you like the most? I mean, I sort of fell into it, to be honest. Um, I, uh, I was an undergraduate in, I started out as an undergraduate in engineering, um, and found that that was a very rigorous uh, sort of program, and I didn't have a lot of uh, options to sort of do my own thing and, and find a path. And so I, I sort of started taking some random classes, and I ended up in a geology class, and I sort of, I've been there ever since. Um, I sort of ended up, yeah, going on to do a master's and then a PhD um, and getting involved in, originally I was, I was a carbonate geochemist, so getting involved in modern coral reefs, so sort of spending my time scuba diving for a living, um, which isn't such a bad thing to do. Uh, and then, yeah, I don't know, I fell in love with microbes and started being sort of interdisciplinary. And it turns out that like microbes have been doing amazing things over Earth history. This is a totally different podcast, but... Um, <laughs> and, but you can't find them in the rock record because they don't fossilize. And so that led me down this pathway of isotope geochemistry. Um, but there are so many other cool things that you can find with isotopes as we'll discuss later. And, and that's where, what sort of kept me going. All right. Well, so, um, I, in some ways it's similar to Aubrey, but you know, I always was into the outdoors and I love fishing and I love rivers, and I knew I wanted to do something environmentally focused, and so I went to um, undergraduate and had that in mind, and I was going to do environmental science, um, and I, you know, you go around, I don't know, it's sort of like, they don't do this anymore, but they used to have these, like, class registration fairs, and, you know, where you, you, you go around and you talk to people who are... Um, you know, like talk to you about the classes that you want to take. And, and I, I went up to the geology booth and I talked to this guy and, and he says, well, what are you into? And I was like, well, you know, I'm really into fly fishing. He goes, oh, me too. And he's, and I was like, so <laughs> I had this moment where I was like, oh, cool. And he's like, I'm a geology and environmental science major. And that's what you should do. Cause like, if you're into fly fishing or, you know, or, or, and rivers and all this, this is what you should do. So I was like, at that moment, I was just like, it smacked me. I was like, oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, I'll do geology. And, you know, I took my first geology class and I was like, I, I, I came home. You know, it just felt right. I always liked history. So that part of it too fit in. And it just like, it meshed everything that I liked. And, you know, um, from there, I guess, 
I really did. I got into earth history. I really just found the whole narrative of, you know, life and the evolution of earth to be uh, really fascinating. And when I heard that there was such a thing as paleoclimatology, I was just like, Oh, okay. That's another one of those things. You're like, that sounds cool. And I wanted to do that. And I kind of had an aptitude for chemistry and I liked to, you know, tinker with stuff and, you know, I have a pretty strong analytical and instrumentation focus. And so I was just never afraid of like taking something apart and trying to put it back together. Um, and, you know, so those, those things meshed together um, at the time, like, you know, stable isotopes were like the hot thing and paleoceanography and all this. And so I, you know, moved on to graduate school and that's actually where I met Aubrey um we 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 started at Penn State at the the same year right yep I think so yeah so so we've been you know we were friends first and then developed into collaborators and have kind of like meandered back and forth over our careers um I've pulled you back in time and you've pulled me forward (laughs) super cool thank you so much so now we're going to talk about your paper your latest study that it found mass independent fractionation of sulfur isotopes. You're gonna have to explain that. Uh, in rocks that formed as a direct result of the end Cretaceous meteorite impact. I'm sure our viewers know which meteorite impact. Um, could you please explain to us what mass independent fractionation of sulfur isotopes is and what it signifies? Um, so this is where the Precambrian becomes really important. Uh, mass independent fractionation of sulfur isotopes is a. It's sort of a a weird anomalous signature that gets incorporated into sulfur gases when they are interact with UV, uh, with UV light. So UV light doesn't penetrate into our, onto our surface today because we have an ozone layer, right? That's why it would be really bad if it did, because it's really damaging to sort of cells and DNA and RNA and things like that. Um, and so, it's this really cool signal of sulfur that's either been up above the ozone layer in the modern environment or a more recent time, or sulfur that has been in the atmosphere before there was an ozone layer. So the, the way that I originally got into this, again, is that I was a sort of a Precambrian biogeochemist, an Archean biogeochemist. And the thing that I've spent most of my career on is the great oxidation event. Um, and so before the great oxidation event on Earth, you see ubiquitous occurrence of these really large, weird anomalies in sulfur, in sulfur uh, isotopes, which are sort of basically the same molecule of sulfur or, or uh, element of sulfur, but with a different number of neutrons in the, in the nucleus, um, and different reactions cause these sort of uh, different isotopes of sulfur to react at different, um, different times. And there are these really strange reactions that happen when you put sulfur sulfur gas in contact with UV light and you get these really weird signals and it's sort of the only way that we know of to get this. And it's ubiquitous throughout the Archean before you had an ozone layer and then it disappears completely. And so where that great oxidation event happens and how high the oxygen levels rose has always been, or within the last 20 years, has been sort of defined by the disappearance of this mass independent fractionation. Or this myth is the easy way to say it. Um, so what's really cool about this uh, this paper is that we sort of, Chris was coming to visit. He was doing a, a global, he got a, a fancy global fellowship to come visit St. Andrews. And we hypothesized that if there was any other time in Earth history that you might see this, it might actually be associated with the KPG impact because you put tons and tons of sulfur above, the, potentially as far up in the atmosphere as above the stratosphere. So this was literally one of these, uh, one of these like super cool like aha moments. Oh hey, Chris said, you know, we were talking about what we were going to do while he was here. He and James Witts and Linda had just been uh, sampling at Brazos and had just been sampling the KPG. And he said, Oh hey, I've got some samples from the KPG. And I said, wow, I've always wanted to try measuring sulfur myth on those. Let's give it a go. And we found, and we were just absolutely gobsmacked. It was just like, wow, this is so cool. We thought it might be there, and there it is. So you explained that the inferred increase in atmospheric sulfur levels likely resulted from either vaporization, like volatization of the rock uh, from the meteorite that impacted it, or from extensive wildfires. Which of these 
potential candidates is the most likely candidate? Do you think it's the volatization of the rock, like the, the, the impact rock? Or is it the wildfires that, that could uh, explain this magnitude and duration of elevated atmospheric sulfur levels? We, we thought a lot about this. Um, you know, it's something that was considered and, you know, brought up in review and, and these kinds of things. And we know that um, biomass burning can directly, um, as a part of the, the combustion process, can produce really small magnitude mass independent fractionation signatures. But it would have had to have meant that, like, all of the sulfur in our rocks would have had to have been derived directly from biomass burning. And these are marine rocks, so that's pretty, that was pretty unlikely. Um, you know, depending upon how extensive the biomass burning was at the KPG, and I know a lot of people, you know, put it in there as an important component of the post-impact environment, and it's probably pretty likely that within, you know, 1,500 to maybe a few thousand kilometers, the, the you know, the, the, the plume and the heat wave from the impact would have caused anything that could burn to burn. So it probably were pretty massive fires. And, you know, sulfur is like a half a percent on average of most plant biomass. And, you know, so when it burns, it makes sulfur aerosols. And um, the primary sulfur aerosol in uh, the atmosphere today is, you know, f primarily from, you know, combustion biomass, it's carbonyl sulfide. So it's OCS. And this is what we talk about in the paper. And it's not very reactive in the, the troposphere, in the lower atmosphere, but it's sneaky in that it can, you know, um, scoot uh, across the tropopause um, at sort of in the equatorial region. And it can get up into the stratosphere. And just like sulfur dioxide might either, you know, in this case from an impact, it can also undergo the same fractionation. So it can, it can, it can have the mass independent fractionation uh, process. And so it's possible that, you know, part of the signal is derived from that. Um, but the most, I mean, you know, I kind of, we, 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 we kind of went through some back of the envelope calculations that we didn't include in the study. Um, but, you know, the, the relative difference is several orders of magnitude in terms of the amount of sulfur that could have been produced. So it's most likely to think that it's, it's, it's from sulfur that was, you know, in the rocks, either as, as gypsum evaporites or as organic sulfur. Because where the, where the meteorite struck was extremely unfortunate, right? <laughs> Right. What is it like eight, eight minutes either side? You know, that's sort of the, the, you know, eight minutes earlier, eight minutes later, and it wouldn't have hit those deposits. So it's really crazy. So since the site you studied is relatively close to the impact location, how is it possible to discern between a local downfall of sulfurous material that may have had a short atmospheric residence time um, and could have been uh, reworked in the sediment, maybe, or long-term atmospheric sulfur compounds that had the potential to influence global climate on the scale that profoundly influenced terrestrial and marine ecosystems? I think this is a really important question, and this is another thing that we thought a lot, lot, lot about. One of the samples that shows the largest signal of this mass-independent fractionation is sort of up into the very latest part of the deposits. Um, and potentially even into the paleogene. And so it, it seems like in order to get that signal preserved throughout these deposits and also into sort of the lower part of, of the next sort of epic or eon or I forget what, whatever it is, um, you really need to have a lot of sulfur uh, up in the atmosphere and then sort of weathering in for a really long time, really long period of time. Um, and to have that be a local signal seems really difficult. You know, the ejected deposits at, at Brazos, um, you know, first of all, is really complicated um, because, you know, th the the substrate that the um, event deposits are on is like is sculpted be probably because of tsunamis or, you know, earthquakes or tempestites. You know, there are lots of ideas as to what's doing it. And tsunami, you know, is probably pretty likely. Um, 
but there's some pretty thick accumulations. And, you know, so we find the, the mass independent fractionation signals within the ejecta proper where you have, you know, spherules and lapilli and, and, you know, armored mud balls and all these things that are probably, whether they're directly related to the immediate aftermath or kind of washed in later, you know, I don't know. And there's a lot of sulfur in there. Um, and it's, it's, you know, Delta 34S. So the conventional sulfur isotopic composition doesn't look like the rest of the, the column, right? You know, it doesn't look like normal marine sulfur isotopes, which, you know, have a relatively characteristic value both in, in the Mastrictian, so in the Cretaceous before the impact, and then in the Paleogene afterwards, which are like minus 40. And then they're, they get really heavy isotopically heavy, so high, higher values that look like they could have been derived perhaps from the gypsum. You know, they look like normal marine sulfate. For, so those of you who don't know, um, you know, different uh, pools of sulfur in the ocean and in rocks um, have different signatures that, you know, reflect their source as well as sort of the pathway that they've taken to get to that spot. So what biological processing has gone or whether they've been up in the atmosphere. And so, you know, there's probably a mixture of signals. Surely there has to be proximal sulfur, you know, that's blasted out of the, the Chicxulub impact structure and rains right down. Um, but, you know, the amount of time that it resides up there um, and is able to be acted upon by UV light is probably pretty small. Like, I mean, I think, you know, estimates are like, you know, minutes to hours before stuff starts like raining down. I think it's based on size as well. Like the ejecta, uh, the larger ejecta, we know that they fell within 15, the first ones within 15 to 30 minutes, but the smaller things get, the longer, the, especially the further they are up in the atmosphere, the longer they have a residence time there. So the longer they can be reacted on. It makes total sense to me. Yeah. And so, but that like last little bit, you know, like where the last samples where we see mass independent fractionation are, you know, they have paleogene microfossils. So, you know, this is probably within 40,000 years wow. of the impact. And so it still might only be that, you know, the signal that we're capturing is, is relatively short, but, you know, our ability to resolve that time in a piece of rock that, you know, a couple of centimeters thick is difficult. So, you know, obviously like higher resolution study would really help resolve that, but it's clear that there was some like, you know, probably, I mean, all of this sulfur that, you know, was up in the atmosphere and then would have ultimately rained down onto land and is working its way down through rivers into the ocean. It still has to have been an amazing amount because it's swamping the massive amount of sulfur that's in the ocean. And that's the, that's the thing for us that kind of got us like, like, how do you do this in the ocean? Like I can understand in like a terrestrial sequence where you might get this signature, but it's just, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. That's the justification of the word massive <laughs> in the title. It sort of shocked us and, and amazed us is that in order to see this, even this, I mean, what we're seeing is a pretty significant uh, signal and that must be massively diluted by seawater sulfate. So what was actually coming out is probably, you know, potentially an order of magnitude even larger, but it's just been diluted by sort of normal marine sulfate. Yeah, I can see that definitely taking place. So how would the increased atmospheric sulfur concentration have affected the global climate and the extinction? Um, do you suggest that the specific, this specific effect of the meteorite aspect is the prime trigger of the extinction event? It's, it's obviously it's a part, right? I mean, there was a lot of sulfur up in the stratosphere. And so, you know, this is something that, you know, the modeling community, both the climate modeling community and the photochemical modeling community can begin to use as a baseline because there are a lot of arguments about like, you know, the, the, the species of sulfur, you know, it makes a big difference in terms of its residence time. Did it actually spend a lot of time up in the stratosphere at all? Or was it mostly in the troposphere? which would mean it would be really short and probably not as important. I mean, I mean, there's no doubt that the, the dust and, you know, rock dust just from the immediate impact would have darkened the skies. And there's, you know, a lot of really cool study out there that show that, 
you know, this is probably a really important component of the immediate, like, you know, days to weeks afterwards. And that would have been enough to, to do a lot of the job. I'm, I'm, I'm sure, um, you know, or just, you know, anything that's raining out of the sky as well. You know, I mean, I imagine how hard it was to breathe or, 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 you know, plunged into darkness, you know, um, but then it just, it, it allows us to maybe extend that window out, which it remained really cold. Um, and, you know, I mean, you look at like the effects of Mount Pinatubo or Mount Tambora on, on climate and, and what it does when it's uh, probably a significantly smaller quantity of sulfur I means several orders of magnitude. Um, you know, gives you a sense of the potential long-term effect. Uh, we have historical records of large stratospheric volcanic eruptions that probably, we say probably because the, the amount of sulfur that actually came, came would have gone up in the impact is, is obviously a large question. And that's one of the things that we hope to help to sort of address with our work. Um, but possibly orders of magnitude less, possibly an order of magnitude less, you see cooling of up to two degrees C over five to six years from these types of stratospheric volcanic eruptions. So you multiply that by, you know, an order of magnitude um, and, you know, time and potentially degree cooling, you could have more cooling, you could have it for much longer. Um, so at the minimum, I think we're looking at, I think that uh, the model on our, on our team, Mark Clare, who has worked with, who has actually a, a PhD student who's modeling uh, sulfur myth formation during stratospheric volcanic eruptions, uh, estimated 30 years of substantial cooling. Um, and I mean, that's enough time if you're, if you're warm blooded, you know, <laughs> it's going to have a, a pretty major impact. Yep. Yeah, and it doesn't sound good. So another loaded question, because I like them. Does this mean you can exclude Deccan Traps volcanism as the cause of the global mass extinction? I'm also not a, the KPG expert in that sense. You know, maybe I should ask you, Melanie. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I, I think that the, the paleo community has, has rested pretty firmly over the last, you know, 10 or 15 years that the most likely mechanism for the extinction is going to be the the impact um i mean and the way that i can speak to it from you know our study is that the mass independent fractionation signatures are confined to the event deposit and the immediately overlying sediments so it's not to say that you know, volcanism didn't play some role in environmental disturbance. Like, I mean, we know that large igneous provinces are a big deal um, and they're connected to the, all kinds of disruptions um, through Earth's history. But, you know, in this this particular case, over this particular interval of time, uh, I feel pretty, pretty firmly that what we're seeing is related uniquely to the impact and not to the, the, the Dickens traps. Um, I, I actually wonder. I actually wonder if it could have been sort of a two two punch. Yeah, I don't know what the metaphor is, but kind of like a double punch. Because my understanding of the sort of potential involvement of the Deccan traps is that there was warming happening, right? Potentially on the run up to this meteorite impact. So if you had an even sort of warmer climate that was stressing everyone out, and then bam, there's an impact. There's a giant fireball that kills a lot of things. So you can either die in the fireball or you can freeze to death later. I'm not sure which is better, but then the sulfur goes into the atmosphere and sort of, you know, makes this nuclear winter and suddenly you've gone from kind of hot and maybe you've started to get used to being kind of hot to like freezing. And so maybe there was actually like an even bigger stressor, um, an even sort of larger swing in the climate. So, you know, I, I'm happy for both of them to have had an effect. <laughs> exactly. We're not saying the Deccan traps didn't happen and didn't have an effect on the environment or on the atmosphere. So uh, could you give a general indication? I think you said 30 years of continental so sulfur deposition. So how much, how long do you estimate that this nuclear winter could have last? Would it be like a generation or several or a millennium? I've heard so many estimates of the nuclear winter that I, I'm, I'm just wondering where you guys 
would put this at. So the 30 years was based on sort of current models of the the residence time of sulfate aerosols from uh, stratospheric volcanic eruptions in the atmosphere. So that that is actually sort of how much time uh, our modeler on board, Mark Clare, uh, sort of estimated with, again, these are major back of the envelope calculations, making lots of assumptions about the amount of sulfur in the atmosphere and, and that it the, the, the uh, atmospheric chemistry would have been a certain way. Um, he sort of estimated that this, this, these sulfate aerosols could have been in the atmosphere for as long as 30 years. And so, yeah, that's, that would sort of be the time period over which you would see this cooling. Wow. I don't know how long dinosaurs lived. Uh, well, I think they've done some estimates, some of the larger dinosaurs living up to like 38, 37 years. But I mean, the fact that they died then doesn't mean that they couldn't have gotten older if they were of better health. So, I, 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 but it would have uh, definitely been the majority of uh, of one's life, I would say, if not more. You're both geochemists, uh, clearly uh, uh, with a fondness of certain time periods. Um, do you have any advice for our viewers who would like to pursue a career in geochemistry? I, I guess I don't know what it is that drew me specifically to geochemistry, um, but you know, I think more generally, I'd say that I have some advice for um, people. Who, who want to get into, you know, earth science, um, and, you know, especially paleo environmental science or geobiology. And obviously geochemistry is involved in there is that, you know, like just find that thing that you're really curious about, you know, what, what is the question that you really want to answer about, um, you know, earth history and then, you know, build the tools you know, and the the knowledge and the understanding and the skills that you need to answer those questions. And if it happens to be that, you know, it's geochemistry or if it's modeling or if it's, you know, paleontology or something, you know, develop those skills to answer those questions. And for me, like, you know, I kind of liked chemistry, so I veered toward, um, you know, things that can be answered with chemistry. And, you know, I guess just don't be afraid to get in there and, you know, get your hands dirty and tinker with stuff and break things. And, you know, but really you just, you have to be driven to try to answer a question. Like, you know, just coming in and being like, oh yeah, I'm going to, you know, do this. That's that, like, you you've got to be you need to be really interested in the subject, I think, to really get into it in a way that um, it's going to keep you driven. So, because it can be hard sometimes, right? You know, like <laughs> you got to get through the hard times to get to the good stuff. So, so that's really interesting because I have a very different point of view because I did not have an aptitude for chemistry at all. And I'm terrified of breaking things and tinkering. Um, but, but I think, I mean, I think this is a thing, right? You, a lot, if you're interested at all in earth science and in environmental science, you're going to find yourself to be an accidental geochemist, even if you don't want to be, because it's, it's absolutely exactly, you can't get away from it. You want to be a paleontologist? Guess what? You're going to have to figure out what environments these organisms lived in, right? I mean, so I think um, I really I'm sort of a big proponent of earth system science and sort of thinking about the earth holistically and the biology plays an important role. The, the geochemistry plays an important role. Tectonics and, and um, geodynamics play an important role. So if you want to tap into any sort of uh, micro niche of, of earth sciences, you're going to you're going to find yourself having to do geochemistry. So just just come, you know, just bite the bullet. <laughs> <laughs> find what find what you love about it. I agree. Um, oh, and and I would definitely say one thing that you could do is that you could enroll in the spectacular MSc in geochemistry degree course that we have at the University of St Andrews, which I serve as the course coordinator for. So that would also be an excellent. <laughs> so there's my plug. <laughs> oh, yeah, now you've got students signing up. I'm sure. So. You're going to sell this even further now because Audrey, you're 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 currently in the field. I am, yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about where you are, what you're doing? 
I am in southern Spain. I have the sunburn to prove it. I'm in the field with our uh, MSC in geochemistry group. Uh, we are doing a field course at, in and around Nerva in southern Spain at the Rio Tinto, uh, looking at the causes and consequences of acid mine drainage and how to remediate it. Um, so it's a week-long course. We got here on Saturday. We're leaving on Saturday. Um, it's really fun. The students, it's been really great this year, especially because obviously we haven't actually been here in, this is the first time we've actually been able to be here in three years. Um, so it's really fun, fun to be here. Um, great cohort building experience. Uh, and it's, it's, it's just a really cool area to study if, if you are looking for any kind of sort of interdisciplinary environmental science, um, because it's got this amazing, story where you sort of start out with the Iberian pyrite belts um, and you've got acid mine drainage forming through all of this amazing chemical weathering and you've got microbiology exacerbating it um, and all of these amazing minerals that precipitate out along the way that are similar to minerals that we find on Mars because Mars had really iron and sulfate rich acidic waters earlier in its history. Um, so there's just a little bit of, of something for, for everybody and it's definitely a uh, I think it's definitely uh, an introduction to loving geochemistry. <laughs> nice, nice. See, more students signing up, I'm sure. Thank you guys so much. You are both genuine rock stars, and I'm so happy to have you on our channel.